Well, as Rachel said, it's the 200th uh, birthday of Sir George Grey this week. He's believed to have been born in Portugal during the Peninsular War. And his father, who was a lieutenant colonel also named George Grey, had apparently been killed just eight days before his birth in an attack on Napoleon's army in Spain. So not a very auspicious start, but Sir George was nothing if not a great tactician, very good at presenting himself in a very good light. So you might know some other politicians like that. But he did bequeath Auckland some wonderful legacies in terms of the artefacts that are now housed here in the museum, books and manuscripts at the city library, and collections of Māori oral traditions that he not only collected but published as well. But it's Gray's political legacy that makes him a love him or hate him kind of a guy. He certainly played a very significant role in New Zealand history, or in New Zealand affairs, from the time of his first arrival as a 33-year-old governor in 1845 until his final departure in 1894 as an octogenarian. So whether for good or for ill, he was a brilliant strategist, or what we might today call a very good spin doctor. As a boy, George Grey had gone to boarding school, but in an early display of um, willfulness, he ran away. And after that, he was tutored by the Reverend Richard Waitley before he went on to then to study at the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. That was at the age of 14. At 18, he became an ensign in an infantry regiment and completed six years' service in Ireland. However, despite being promoted to lieutenant and undergoing further study at Sand, uh, Sandhurst, he decided that the army wasn't really for him. But that time that he spent in Ireland with the army had a very big influence on him. He was horrified by the level of poverty in Ireland and also by the treatment that was meted out to the poor by landlords. So that experience and perhaps the teachings of his um, one-time tutor, Richard Waitley, who was a theologian and a political economist, probably led him to support the idea that immigration offered a solution to those social problems. So with immigration in mind, that George Grey approached the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Glenelg, with the idea of exploring parts of Western Australia, looking for land that might be suitable for British settlement. There we go. And it was, although his expeditions proved to be of little value, it was probably during this time that he married Eliza Lucy Spencer, was her maiden name. And it was also during that period that another lifelong interest emerged, and that was the cultures of indigenous peoples and how they might best be governed. But Gray's ideas gained a lot of favour in the British colonial office, and even though he was still only in his 20s, he was offered the governorship of South Australia, which at that time was facing very grave financial difficulties. It was 1841. He quickly put pen to paper, using memoranda and official dispatches to pour blame on his luckless predecessor, a man called George Gawler. Gray was expected to cut expenditure dramatically, which he did, some felt rather ruthlessly, and he frequently disobeyed instructions to achieve his goals. So his methods came in for lots of criticism, but he took no notice at all, didn't he? he refused to read newspapers that were critical of him. But although it wasn't widely acknowledged at the time, his native, um, he did largely succeed in turning around the country's, the colony's financial situation. But it was his native policy that was more problematic. There'd been ongoing tension and conflict between Australian Aboriginal people and the settlers, which he could do little to quell. His plan then for the Australian Aborigines was to convert them to Christianity, bring them under British law and civilise them and promote their employment by white settlers. This was all part of his pr programme to assimilate Indigenous people into Western ways of living and it was one that he would repeat here in New Zealand with a little more success. But having served four years in Australia, Gray was ordered to take over the government of New Zealand because our country was now in financial trouble and we needed a list to fix it. So he arrived in November 1845, armed with instructions that were vague enough for him to do pretty much as he pleased. 
but he did face two big problems initially. War in the north and the virtual finan- uh, bankruptcy of this colony. So there had already been violent disputes between settlers and Māori, especially over pre-treaty land claims and also dodgy land purchases by the New Zealand Company in Wellington, Taranaki and Nelson. But things were worse in Northland, where Kawati and his ally Hanehike, who famously chopped down the flagstaff four times, were still in revolt against the British. But whereas the previous governor, Robert Fitzroy, had few resources and suffered a severe reprimand for borrowing a few troops from the Australian command, Gray got both the finance and the troops necessary to deal with the situation. But rather than draw attention to those advantages, Gray disparaged Fitzroy's efforts, implying the superiority of his own. So it was now generally agreed that Fitzroy really had little chance of succeeding within the terms and conditions of his appointment. And that the proof of this lay in in the changed instructions and conditions that were offered to Gray. The Northern War ended with Gray accepting a partial Maori victory in the final battle and reassuring the combatants that none of their land would be confiscated. In fact, he blamed their grievances on the huge areas of land that members of the Church Missionary Society had claimed, claimed to have purchased prior to the Treaty of Waitangi. One claim alone was for 20,000 acres. But as for the New Zealand economy, well, our piggy bank was decidedly empty when he got here. Prior to the treaty, though, New Zealand had been, uh, trade through New Zealand had been quite significant. Māori had been supplying New South Wales with basic foodstuffs like pork, potatoes and even wheat, as well as materials like timber and prepared flax for rope making. And that level of trade was absolutely vital to the sustainability of New South Wales, so it had actually been an important consideration in Britain's uh, deciding to offer a treaty to Māori. However, from 1840, Māori production shifted to cater for the incoming immigrants. So internal consumption rather than export. Blaming the mismanagement of his two predecessors, William Hobson and Robert Fitzroy, for the sad, sad state of affairs, and that was something that was becoming a bit of a habit, served to put Gray in a better light immediately. Six months after his arrival, he'd reviewed the colony's gloomy financial situation and called on the British Parliament to provide a grant to cover five or six years to get the country up and running. Now, he supported his application for that money by proposing to introduce what he referred to as a moderate customs tariff and by pointing out that Māori were developing considerable commercial interests, which would soon see the colony become, uh, then become substantial contributors to the colony and the colony self-sufficient. He also argued that prudent expenditure on road construction and institutions for the civilization of Māori would ensure the agricultural and commercial expansion that would allow the colony to become self-sufficient. It worked, the proposal worked, he got the money and continued to produce a stream of positive reports assuring everybody in London that everything here was tickety-boo. But his policies weren't appreciated by everyone, especially the settlers, many of whom resented his support of Māori enterprise. And while his motives weren't always entirely altruistic, they did go a long way towards developing Māori commerce, especially in the key industries of agriculture and transport, shipping. But his assistance was channelled very strongly towards certain areas, the most fertile lands of the, or fertile areas of the North Island, places where Māori still owned their land. Settlers referred to this uh, programme rather disparagingly as Gray's flour and sugar policy. Gray certainly did promote Māori commerce in a number of meaningful ways, and his policy was significant for sponsoring Māori investment in trading ships, agricultural production, the construction of water-powered flour mills, and publishing newspapers in the Māori language with advice about approved lifestyles and British law, among other things. Gray's plans for agricultural expansion fitted very well with the missionaries' ideas too. They wanted to encourage Māori to take up farming, a more settled, less nomadic lifestyle. And that biblical metaphor of turning swords into plowshares was very commonly repeated with regard to Māori adoption of European 
horticultural methods, wheat cultivation, flower milling, that sort of thing. In 1847, he compiled the first return of Maori-owned coastal vessels for the northern part of the country. And that provided details of over 45 vessels over 10 tonnes that were already owned by Māori and noted that another, 10, sorry, another five were under construction. Two years later, he started compiling the same sorts of returns for Māori-owned water-powered flammels as well. In 1849... Gray informed his boss in London that he'd been making loans to a few principal chiefs to buy trading ships. He pointed out that the, tra the tribes on the east coast in particular were producing large quantities of wheat, maize, flax, potatoes and other produce. And not only were they Christian, but they'd always been attached to the government and wanted to promote Christianity and civilization amongst their people. However, due to the absence of roads, they could only transport their production by canoe, and that might be over a distance of 300 to up to 600 kilometres. Which meant, he said, that they were left in a state of comparative poverty, British trade was limited, and there was no way for Māori to pay for the manufactured goods, so the price of provisions was higher than necessary. So he was trying to explain that this idea of providing loans to selected chiefs would increase the trade of the colony, train up a race of, race of coasting seamen, and that these things would be of a great advantage to the British interests and foster loyalty to government. So he kept sending regular dispatches to London, supporting his policies and affirming the success of his programs. But regardless of how embellished his dispatches might have been, Māori commerce did continue to expand vigorously. So Māori flower was among the exhibits, Māori produced flower was among the exhibits at the 1851 Great Exhibition in London at the Crystal Palace. And one Hokianga chief even arranged for his own agent to display his uh, wares, if you like, at that exhibition. Taunui's uh, valuable little collection of New Zealand woods earned him a prize medal. And items made from flax were said to be worthy of honourable mention. So that's the catalogue entry from that exhibition um, recording Tānui's um, exhibits. Now, following that exhibition, New Zealand uh, well, re received this set of medals, uh, which George Gray received on behalf of the colony and gifted to the forerunner of this museum. And they're on display now in the ground floor. Um, that's the, the dis presentation case opened up with the medals on it, so you, you can take a look at those if you're interested. Souvenir of the, that great exhibition. Gray was always keen to point out that the promotion of Māori commerce would have great benefits for British interests. And among those benefits was the hard financial fact that their contribution to the government's revenue would, in his words, provide for their own more perfect control in government. Moreover, he suggested that the Māori market for manufactured goods was already of considerable consequence to British merchants. Gray never lost his talent for presenting bad news in a more palatable form. So he was deflecting attention away from the unfavourable balance of trade in many ways by adding in this case that the local, that local consumption of goods merely renders the transaction much more profitable for their country as the cost of, of shipment and other charges are saved. <clears throat> Excuse me, but his pragmatism went even further when he included among reasons for avoiding hostilities with Māori the fact that for each individual, this is a quote, for each individual who fell in such a conflict, it might have been said that from his ignorance a man had been destroyed whom with a few months' enlightenment would have rendered a good subject, a valuable consumer of manufactured goods and contributor to the revenue. So in other words, don't let's kill our customers. Now, during his first governorship in the 1840s and 50s, Gay, Gray tended to perform or be comprehended by Māori as a supreme chief. He was often referred to by Pākehā as an autocrat, but he spelled out the approach or in, his, in the preface to his book, Polynesian Mythology. I soon perceived that I could neither successfully govern nor hope to conciliate a numerous and turbulent people with whose language, manners, customs, religion and modes of thought I was quite unacquainted. 
So, he went on, it was necessary that I should be able to thoroughly understand their complaints and to win their confidence and regard, so that he'd be able to give them a kind reply, couched in such terms as should leave no doubt on their minds that I clearly understood and felt for them and was really well disposed towards them. But while this worked well, because Māori did recognise him as acting like a traditional Māori leader, he and his successors were simultaneously denying the mana and authority of hereditary leaders. And that would have quite a significant long-term impact on the cohesion of Māori society. Now, Greg learned to speak the Māori language with the help of Te Rangi Kaheke from Te Arawa, who was one of several learned Māori who provided the oral traditions published in Māori language as Ngā Mahi a Ngā Tūpuna, um, that Polynesian mythology was an English language version of that book. And both books were published in 1854. As for his work with Māori people, and because his financial resources were limited, Gray worked very closely through missionaries in the field, forming particularly close relationships with some of them. He subsidised mission schools, which were required to teach the English language, and he aimed to educate adults, Māori adults, through uh, newspapers, Māori language newspapers, and other texts that were translated into Māori. He was really keen for them to understand and support the British legal system and to take on Western political economic ideas. Both he and the missionaries, for example, were really keen to try and encourage individualistic attitudes amongst Māori and to break down their communal society. Yeah, during his first governorship, he tended to use the carrot and stick approach to some extent, and his carrots did generally work pretty well, and he was quite generous with some of his carrots, especially to those Māori who professed Christianity, loyal to the British, and who were blessed with fertile lands. So from the time of his arrival in 1845 until his departure in 1853, Māori commerce and Māori economy, especially in the North Island, was booming. But those carrots were very frequently counterbalanced by sticks. And some of those sticks were evident soon after his arrival, and some of them were pretty brutal indeed. So, for example, these four people here are among a group of five who were arrested in connection with fights over land at the time, and they should have been treated as prisoners of war. This is in 1846. But Gray treated them as rebels against the government and ordered what was a probably a legal court martial. None of these people spoke English, they didn't have any legal counsel, but Gray had them transported to Tasmania. The authorities over there in Tasmania were not very impressed with him for that action, and they did try to ameliorate the conditions of these people. But, you know, this was actually not the worst thing. Others were executed for trying to protect their lands. But none of this seems to have affected the way Gray was viewed in London. He was knighted in 1848, and nor did it necessarily blacken his image amongst all Māori. A number of very sad letters of farewell that were written to him when he left in 1843, have been published and translated into English. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, many northern tribes were doing actually quite well, or North Island tribes were doing well from their commercial enterprises at this time. But for various reasons unrelated to Gray's policies, the golden age of Māori commerce would soon be over. The end of the gold rush in Victoria, Australia, saw the price of flour, wheat and produce and generally plummet really dramatically. And the little sailing ships that made up the Māori fleet were becoming obsolete in the face of steamships, newfangled steamships. But before we leave Gray's first governorship altogether, I have to mention the political changes that were already in train for his departure, because these had a huge influence not only on Māori fortunes, but on New Zealand history. And they relate to moves away from government in London or from London towards settler self-government. Gray had actually counselled against this being introduced too hastily, while the Māori population was, in his words, dominant. By placing them in an inferior position, he wrote, a feeling of nationality would be created, the consequence of which would be hurtful. 
He also warned against giving such extensive powers over the funds raised from the taxation of a large native population into the hands of so small a British population. So that was a reference to Murray commerce and the high proportion of customs revenue that was coming from their purchases and so on. So as we will see, he was very right on, the account, on that account about it being hurtful. But meanwhile, Gray went on to govern the Cape Colony in southern Africa, where he followed very similar policies that he had here. So, but it was when he returned from second governorship in 1861 that Gray's darker side really comes to the fore. His marriage, that had apparently never been terribly happy, was over. Eliza, his wife, had previously accused him of unfaithfulness, and plenty of other people whispered about his womanising. But on the way to South Africa, she had formed a close, romantic, probably not sexual relationship with Rear Admiral Sir Henry Keppel. Gray, who was outraged and humiliated by this friendship, had her put ashore very unceremoniously in Brazil, and the couple were not reconciled until very shortly before their deaths. So whether it was this that soured him, or whether New Zealand was simply seeing the other side of Gray's nature, that perhaps had always been there, but had been concealed with his clever public relations skill, who knows. But few would doubt that his second governorship was a tragic disaster. When he did come back, like those letters of farewell, he was again greeted with a whole lot of warm, welcoming letters from Maori leaders um, who were very keen to have him back. But of course their impressions changed quite soon after that as a result of his handling of the warfare that had broken out in Taranaki in 1860. On the basis of his great mana with Māori, or that, that this great mana that he had with Māori and his standing would place him in good stead to restore peace, Gray offered his services to New Zealand again. But no sooner was this agreed than he got up to his old trick of attacking his predecessor, in this case Governor Thomas Gore Brown. With the passing of the New Zealand Constitution Act, a settler government had been established. And I say settler government because property qualifications effectively disenfranchised most Māori whose land was still communally owned under customary title. And as Gray had warned, settler government was very hurtful indeed. What had brought things to a head in 1860 was William Kingi's refusal to sell his land at the Waitara in Taranaki. Kingi was living on that land and had been doing spectacularly well as what we might today refer to as an agribusinessman. Six years earlier, when the Pākehā farmers of Port Nicholson or Wellington were doing it pretty tough, Kingi was doing spectacularly well. So the dilemmas for Pākehā settlers were evident in 1855, so when Kingi was doing well, because the Taranaki provincial treasurer refused to allow the province's harbour um, vessels to go up to Waitara and load Māori produce. The idea was that by assisting them with, uh, to profit from their production would only make them more determined not to sell their land to settlers. As the provincial chairman noted, Gray had encouraged uh, and cultivated friendly relations by assisting Māori with things like money, seed and flour mills, a policy that he said was almost invariably followed by the sale of native lands. But the settlers were impatient, and so Kingi had been labelled as a uh, defiant for refusing to sell his land. So the upshot of this, or one of the responses, was the, to this increasing economic and political marginalisation, as well as anxiety about the inability of Māori to stem the tide of immigration and land loss, some of the Waikato tribes had established a Māori king in 1858. And it was also around about that year, around about that time, that the Pākehā population, the white population, started to overtake Māori in numbers. So the king's supporters gave him the authority to implement a policy of withholding land from sale as a means of controlling and slowing the rate of settlement and immigration. Governor Brown had responded to that by threatening to invade the Waikato and depose the king, some of whose supporters had joined um, Taranaki in their fight against the government. Gray initially tried to deal with the situation less belligerently, introducing a system of indirect rule in the Waikato and elsewhere. He appointed civil commissioners and resident magistrates who he intended to work cooperatively with local runanga 
or Māori district councils. But the ideas weren't very effective in the Waikato where people were pretty suspicious of the intentions. And the settlers were nervous too, especially in Auckland, and were fearing a possible attack from Waikato. So in 1863, Gray started building a military road into the heart of their territory. As Keith Sinclair put it, it was a, it, the road was built in case his policies failed, but actually ensured that they would. And it was in that same year that Gray investigated the Waitara Purchase, this land of Wirunu Kingis in Taranaki, and which had precipitated the War of 1860-61. And Gray initially proposed to return it to their owners. But before he could do that, Southern Taranaki Māori, outraged at the reoccupation of their land at Tātaraimaka, attacked some government troops, egged on apparently by Rui Maniapoto, a prominent supporter of the King movement. Then in March 1863, the Office of the Government Civil Commissioner, set up in the Waitakato, was sacked. So after inflicting a heavy defeat on the Taranaki rebels, Gray and his army returned to Auckland. The Northern Chief, Patuani, who was a good friend of um, Gray and helped to ensure the security of Auckland, begged Gray not to be the first to cross the Mangatāwhiri stream. That was the established boundary that Māori had warned the government not to cross. Because, said Patuani, that would put the Pākehā in the wrong. But Gray did, of course, as many of you will know, in July 1863, and the ill feeling from that has lasted for generations. Finally, when the hostilities ended, Gray and his ministers agreed to confiscate some three million acres of land for reallocation to military settlers. And the idea was that their presence would discourage further um, tensions and so on, further rebellion. And that land, of course, was in the most fertile areas where Māori production had been the greatest and where the economy had boomed. General Cameron, the British general, had been very suspect, sus, uh, circumspect in his military actions in Taranaki and suspected, rightly it would seem, that his services and those of his soldiers were actually being used to acquire Māori land for settlers. And nor was the British government very keen to keep imperial troops in New Zealand, or anywhere else for that matter. They wanted to make the countries, the colonies, sorry, the British colonies responsible for their own internal security. But Māori generals like Te Koti and Te Waru were doing very well, and the settlers were so alarmed that neither Gray nor his ministers were in any hurry to comply, and they kept stalling the regiment's departure. Finally, London took matters into their own hands and um, terminated Gray's appointment. That was in 1868. He was just getting too hard to deal with for them. The New Zealand government here voiced their strong disapproval of his sacking. They passed overwhelming votes of thanks to, to Gray and sent protests to Queen Victoria, sentiments that were largely supported by the local press here. So here, Gray was hailed as a national hero and a martyr to selfish Britain's um, neglect of New Zealand. But as well as the confiscations, which were eventually reduced to just over 1.5 million acres or 600-odd thousand hectares, it's still remembered that it was under Gray's governorship that the Native Land Court first commenced operations. Its purpose was to transfer Maori land from customary ownership to freehold title. And while in theory it wasn't compulsory for Maori to take their land before the court, in reality many were actually forced to, so that virtually all the land that was still in Maori ownership in 1865 was eventually converted to Maori title. Native land courts saw huge areas of native land or Māori land being sold against its owner's wishes. The multiplicity of ways in which this is done is a huge topic in itself, so I don't intend to get into that today at all. But the Māori perspective is probably summed up in the name, that the, the label that they gave to that court, the Land Taking Court, which became the title of a book by a professor of law at Auckland University. Anyway, having been sacked in 1868, Gray returned to England and tried to get a seat in the British Parliament. But, having failed, he came back to New Zealand and returned to his home mansion house on Kawa Island in the Hauraki Gulf. So that's a picture of him with his adopted niece, Annie Thorne George, in the drawing room. 
and I know I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to whiz on. This is an, a photograph that was also taken. I'm sorry the quality of the photo isn't terribly good. It's the best I can get. It's a collection of artefacts, Māori artefacts, that he had already collected and which was then housed at Mansion House on Kawa Island. And where I put the arrows, um, those red arrows, you can see that uh, canoe craft down there at the bottom right, and up towards the top left, there's a, a flute, a puterino, and a little statue. Now, I think if we go here, these, th the two items on the left and the canoe craft down here, uh, in the museum today. In fact, when I arrived today, I spotted this one in the conservation area. When you come into the atrium there, as you go in on the left, is the conservation area, which is all glass, and I can actually see somebody working on that at the moment today. Um, and I put that kite up there too as well, because I think that's particularly beautiful. It's a very rare kite. But, uh, but So there's all sorts of things here that relate to George Gray's life, as well as the things he collected. Um, the, on the left there is his dispatch box from the wars of the 1880s together with some seals, sorry, 1860s, the wars of the 1860s, with some seals. This is a, if you have a look carefully, you can see George GG monograms on, on this bag, which is up in 1866 Street. And top left is a, uh, a medal from the Royal Zoological Society, which was, was presented to Sir George for in, in thanking him for the collection of South African animals that he presented to them. So these are just, you know, some more of the things that were here in the, that are here in the museum. Again, Maori uh, uh, artifacts like those stone flax pounders, beautiful pieces of silverware, this puppet. Now I know that Rose Young, the his, uh, history custodian here, was particularly excited when she discovered this wax cylinder. So many of you will know wax cylinders were one of the very early forms of recording devices. And so when she saw this, which was, had a label on it saying, message from Sir G. Gray to the citizens of Auckland, it promised to you know, give him voice, literally. Um, but unfortunately, that's the presentation case that the wax cylinder was um, in, stored in. The, the wax cylinder was damaged and Rose actually took it all the way to Melbourne, Australia very carefully like a fragile baby to some specialists over there to repair it but even having repaired it, it, it turned out that it's silent, there is no sound. So I know she's hopeful that there might be another recording somewhere might turn up one day. I was hoping that the uh, modern technology might allow me to, to give this the song Happy Birthday and give, give it some sound. Well, that case, we do have a photograph Sir George Gray listening, Speaking. listening to the recording. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I've seen it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there you go. So I, I, I better finish up now because I know we're running out of time. But um, uh, yeah, there's lots of treasures here just in the museum itself related to George. And I think Diane might mention some of those too before you go. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.